Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Beyond Center's November Ask a Physicist webinar. Tonight's uh, big question is how many universes are there? If you have joined us before, we are glad to have you back. And if you're joining us for the first time, we're happy to have you here and we hope you enjoy the webinar. If you have any questions during the talk, please use the chat feature within Zoom to submit them. Tonight is our last Ask a Physicist of the semester, but we will be starting up again in January with the question, did life on Earth happen more than once? So make sure you keep the last Mondays of the month at 6 p.m. open and be on the lookout for emails with registration links. For now, I will turn it over to our moderator for the evening and the Beyond Center Deputy Director, Sarah Walker. Thank you, Jessica. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this month's Ask a Physicist. Uh, we have a very exciting topic for you today, which is how many universes are there, which hopefully we'll be able to answer by the end of our evening. Um, together. Um, so my job today is to introduce our two illustrious speakers and also to moderate questions. Um, as Jessica mentioned, you can enter your questions in the chat at any time. Um, and we will have a very lively discussion after our two panelists give uh, present presenting views um, that are hopefully a little bit contradictory. Um, so we can have a little bit of a debate. Um, and so first I'm going to introduce Paul Davies. Paul is Regents Professor at Arizona State University and an internationally renowned cosmologist, theoretical physicist and astrobiologist and author of many books. Um, and he's going to lead us into our discussion this evening. So Paul, I'm going to pass over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And I hope everybody can hear me okay. And uh, welcome. Uh, it's, uh, as Sarah mentioned, this is the last, but we're going to carry on next semester. So uh, do join us then. Uh, the plan, uh, as always, is that I will talk for 10 or 15 minutes, uh, then Molik will uh, talk for 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll uh, have about half an hour when we can deal with questions. And we have received some already, and one or two of these questions I think will be answered during the presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen, and I've got a PowerPoint presentation here, which, uh, which I hope everybody can see. And um, uh, Sarah, let me know if anything uh, goes a bit wrong here. Uh, I'm, I'm doing this from a strange place, borrowing somebody else's uh, Wi-Fi. So. Um, uh, so the topic, how many universes are there? Well, uh, I think uh, everybody knows that these days, physicists are convinced, cosmologists are convinced that the universe began with a Big Bang. And the issue about the Big Bang that always arises is, um, was it a natural process or a supernatural? So you have one or the other. And uh, most scientists, of course, think that it would be a natural process. And so that raises an interesting question, uh, because if the universe came into being, maybe from nothing, uh, in accordance with some sort of uh, physical law, well, it would be a strange sort of law that acted only once. And so you think, well, if, uh, if a universe, the universe, this universe, uh, can come to exist, uh, in a law-like manner, uh, then uh, surely that could happen more than once. Surely if there was a big bang gave us to our universe, there could be many bangs scattered uh, throughout space and time. Uh, and so the idea of um, a multiverse or many universes uh, is, is a very sort of obvious one. It follows immediately from your decision about whether the origin of the universe is, is natural or supernatural. Uh, so the question is how many uh, other universes might there be? Uh, and uh, it seems to me that we can rule out uh, zero because uh, just on the basis of observation, um, uh, we know that there's at least uh, one universe. So let's go up one more. How about two universes? Uh, why would it be the case that there might be two universes? Well, again, there's a rather fundamental principle of work in physics, uh, which is that uh, we're used to the idea that uh, things being created, for example, subatomic particles being created as a result of quantum processes. Now, just about everybody who works in cosmology 
believes that the Big Bang was some sort of quantum event, uh, that if you go back in time far enough to the so-called Planck time, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, quantum effects would have been important. So to understand how the universe came to exist, we would appeal to quantum gravity or quantum cosmology. So what does quantum mechanics tell us about creation? Uh, well, uh, from time to time, particles are created. This is a picture of uh, creation events like that. This is a electron positron pair creation back in the old days when they did these things in uh, bubble chambers and took pictures. And what you're seeing there in these spirals are the tracks left by the creation of an electron positron pair. I think I've got, I'm interpreting that correctly, but it actually doesn't matter if somebody recognizes this as something else. The point being that particles get created in pairs. Uh, you get a particle and you get its antiparticle at the same time. Uh, so could it be the case uh, that when the universe came to exist as a result of some sort of quantum event, uh, that there were a pair, or there's a universe and an anti-universe. What does an anti-universe mean? Um, this is a speculation that's been around for a while. Uh, one, one thing it could mean is that the arrow of time, uh, which we dealt with in a, in a previous Ask a Physicist, is reversed in this anti-world or anti-universe. But we can imagine that somehow uh, when our universe was created, another one got created but with time, as it were, running in the opposite direction. And where we have matter, it would have antimatter and so forth. So any of the symmetries that are broken in our universe uh, would be, uh, ha have the, ob the opposite uh, symmetry breaking in this other universe. So it would all add up to sort of zero in a sense, uh, but we would have separated out uh, um, an asymmetry world with time forward from uh, a world going the other way. And that's a possibility and that's a speculation that actually goes back uh, many, many decades that our universe has a sort of, um, uh, accompanying anti-world. Um, then we leap to a much bigger number, 10 to the power of 500. Uh, this is a sort of made up number really. And this comes from a branch of physics called string theory. Many of you will be familiar with it. It's an attempt to provide a truly unified theory of all particles and forces uh, uh, on the basis that the fundamental building blocks of the world are not particles after all, but little loops of string that wiggle around and the um, modes of vibration on the string represent different particles. So it's very popular theory, lots of people work on it. We have people at ASU working on this, uh, but uh, at the moment it's a, a project uh, in progress. Uh, we can't yet say that the world is put together like this, uh, but one of the features of string theory that some people like and some people hate uh, is that it doesn't describe a unique world. It would be great if we had a fundamental theory of everything that uh, describe the world as we observe it in all its detail with all of the numerical things being predicted. Well, it doesn't do that. It provides instead uh, an entire landscape of different possible worlds. Uh, and uh, how many? Well, uh, some people estimate uh, 10 to the 500. Uh, that's a very big number, much bigger than two, which I was talking about last. Um, but it's important to realize that these uh, different worlds that are being described by string theory are not necessarily instantiations of worlds. You might have 10 to the 500 different or different possibilities of worlds, but each one might be instantiated a limitless number of times. Uh, so we very soon come up with the idea uh, that the choices we have are really one, two or in infinity. And it's very easy to imagine an infinity of worlds Again, on the philosophical grounds, if you think about it, uh, supposing there's not an infinity, supposing there's a large number of, of universes, but it's not infinite, um, could it be 5,478 universes? Well, um, again, it would be a funny sort of uh, system in which there was a, a, a possibility of having a very large number of universes, but something put a limit on that number. Where would that limit come from? who would get to decide uh, you know, how many is enough. So it does seem like we are stuck with one, two or infinity. Uh, and the idea of uh, an infinite number of universes uh, really has been around for a long time. And the, the way in which this is normally described is that each universe would come 
with its own set of laws. And the 10 to the 500 I just mentioned uh, described the different types of laws that might exist in these universes. Uh, and so uh, Martin Rees described this very well, I think, by uh, saying that uh, we would think of the laws of physics really as just like local bylaws rather than, uh, as it were, federal laws, uh, <coughs> or maybe state laws rather than federal laws would be a better fit uh, in, in the United States. Uh, and, uh, and so if you went from one universe to another, you might uh, have different laws of physics. And so uh, this leads uh, the, the evidence, the reason that people introduced this was to explain what I call the Goldilocks enigma, but the evidence for a multiverse might just come from considering uh, the fact that the universe is surprisingly well suited to life. This has been noted for many, many decades. Uh, I'm going to not dwell too much on this. Many of you will be familiar with the arguments, but supposing you didn't like the universe the way it is, um, but you were an omnipotent creator and you have before you a designer machine with all these different dials, uh, maybe turn one dial uh, and all electrons get a bit heavier. You turn another dial, the weak force gets a bit weaker and so on. Now we, we don't have this machine, uh, we don't have the budget to build one anyway, uh, but we can do the thought experiment. We can say, well, what if we left everything unchanged, but uh, just change the mass of the electron a bit or something like that. And it's very easy to convince yourself uh, that some of those uh, dial settings are, are very sensitive. And that if you change uh, the parameters just by a small amount, life will be impossible. And the British cosmologist many years ago, Fred Hoyle, said that, uh, that he thought uh, as a result of this, that the universe was what he called a put up job. Uh, it looked like a fix, a cosmic fix. Um, I'll give you a very simple example. It's not a very good example, but I'll uh, just make the point. I th think everyone knows the neutron is slightly heavier than the proton. Uh, and if it's left on its own for about 15 minutes, it will decay into a proton. Um, it's a tiny, tiny difference. If that difference were around the other way, protons would decay into neutrons if the proton was slightly more massive. That'd be really bad news because uh, protons um, are the nuclei of hydrogen atoms. And if protons were to decay just after the Big Bang, there'd be no hydrogen. Uh, and without the hydrogen to build the heavier elements, there'd be no carbon, no chemistry, no people, uh, nobody to bemoan the fact that the universe was totally sterile. So you see just on that tiny neutron proton mass difference, our very existence hinges. Um, Hoyle himself was uh, amazed by the, the fact that carbon, the life-giving element, uh, isn't made in the Big Bang, it's made instead inside large stars that then explode and spew it around uh, the universe. And uh, when he uh, tried to study how the carbon could be produced inside stars, I'm not going to dwell too much on the technical details, it depended on what physicists call a resonance, uh, a happy coincidence of energy scales that meant that three helium nuclei could come together uh, and would hang around long enough because of this resonance to make a carbon nucleus. At the time he suggested that, this wasn't known. Um, it was a mystery as to how carbon is made, uh, but he was absolutely right. And he pointed out that if the strong nuclear force that binds uh, protons and neutrons together, the nuclei were very slightly different one way or the other, there would be no carbon and no Fred Hoyle. Um, and there are many examples like this. Uh, the reason I put up Willie Fowler is he's the one who didn't believe it and then tested it and found that Fred was, was right. Uh, and Fred, uh, in a, a typically sensation of this comment, said it seemed as if a super intellect had been monkeying with the laws of physics. So this is, is a problem. Uh, for physicists who don't like the idea of any, anyone monkeying with the laws of physics, uh, but everyone recognizes that the universe is um, peculiarly bio-friendly. Uh, it does seem to be rigged in favor of life. Um, now, uh, invoking a multiverse, uh, of course, gives a natural explanation for this, because if you have all these different universes, each with their different laws, then inevitably, by chance, in uh, some some of those universes, the numbers will come out just right for life. So it becomes a biological selection effect. So one of the reasons that cosmologists like the multiverse is it explains the Goldilocks enigma, but it doesn't explain everything. For example, 
you have to have a universe generating mechanism. Something has to make all those universes and something has to distribute the laws of um, physics across those universes. Uh, and so uh, one possible universe generating mechanism is called eternal inflation. Uh, again, too limited in time to deal with this in detail. But the idea basically is that uh, uh, our universe, our uh, Big Bang, uh, is just a bubble that's separated out from, from a wider superstructure that is doubling in time in a, in a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. And it goes on doubling uh, uh, eternally. So that the multiverse as a whole is a population of universes like bubbles in a, in a uh, drink uh, that come out of this inflating superstructure. And the inflation goes on forever, it's eternal. So there's no beginning in their end. But each universe has a beginning, a life story, and, uh, and maybe an end. And so that's a sort of natural framework to consider the uh, multiplicity of universes and the Goldilocks enigma. Um, but uh, once you unleash the idea of worlds without end, um, and this actually takes care of, this was in the, the talk already, but it takes care of one of the questions from Barbara Temple that um, uh, surely if the universe is infinite or if there are an infinite number of separate universes, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to have the problem of duplicate beings, that there will be a universe somewhere that will have an identical copy of you and me. And uh, uh, more rarely, but uh, surely somewhere, a, a duplication of the entire uh, physical universe that we observe. And Max uh, Tegmark took the trouble, uh, supposing we just have one universe, but it's infinite in extent and homogeneous. How far do you have to go over there uh, in order to encounter another copy of yourself? And it's about 10 to the power 10 to the power 29 meters. And uh, if you want to duplicate uh, Hubble volume, it's 10 to the 10 to the 120 meters. So these are stupendous numbers, but you know, infinity is very big and uh, it beats stupendous numbers every time. So in uh, an infinite universe or an infinite number of universes, you can be assured that there are duplicates of yourself uh, and, and the whole universe. So for some people, it's a philosophical problem. Um, I'm gonna skip over this. It's, uh, we dealt with it uh, previously as the universe of fake, which we have to add all the fake worlds as well. So how many universes are there? Well, it's unlikely, this conclusion, unlikely to be something like 847. It seems it's gotta be one, two or infinity. And I will just say the case for one, uh, it is the simplest, um, it's not, true to say that if you have a multiverse, everything's explained because you still have to explain why that multiverse and why that universe generating mechanism. Uh, there's still a lot to explain and um, you're just pushing the problem up one level. Uh, this multiverse still has to have super laws uh, and in eternal inflation, for example, you have to have uh, gravitation and uh, quantum mechanics to make that work. Where do they come from? Where is, where does, how does this multiverse come to exist? Or if it's always existed, why that multiverse and not a different multiverse? I'm gonna stop there. I've slightly overrun my time. Sorry, Malik, but do pick up from where I've left off and then we'll revisit some of these things during question time. Thank you, Paul. That was delightful. Um, lots of information for our audience to mull over and we're already getting some good questions. Um, so our next um, panelist is Malik Parika. And he is a theoretical physicist at Arizona State University and a professor in the physics department. Um, and his expertise is in gravity um, and he's really at the forefront of that field um, and we'll have a lot to say at tonight's topic. So I'm gonna pass over to you now, Malik. Thank you. Um, let me just share my screen here. Uh, here we go. Right, is this visible? Okay, great. So <clears throat> how many universes are there? So this question um, doesn't even sound like a physics question. You know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of question you might expect from religion or poetry or, um, or, or Hollywood. Um, and uh, it is a beautiful question, but, but I want to um, ask whether there's, I want to sort of talk about the science of it and, uh, and see where that takes us. So first of all, I'd, I wanna answer that question 
about whether this, the, the, the question of the number of uh, universes is even a scientific, is even a question that's, uh, that's falls under science. I mean, is it something that uh, if we can never detect these other universes uh, it, it, and it's not sort of falsifiable, is this, is this, or is this just sort of a wild speculation? And I don't think that's the case because the multiverse is not actually a theory. The multiverse is a prediction of, of physics theories that we have. Uh, and if we believe those physics theories, uh, which I think there are some reasons for doing, uh, then we should take all of their predictions seriously. Uh, it's sort of like asking uh, what happens inside a black hole. Uh, that's also something we can't directly ex uh, access ever in an experiment. Nevertheless, if we trust Einstein's theory of general relativity for which there's an overwhelming amount of evidence, then we should take all its predictions seriously, including things that we cannot actually directly test. So the multiverse, I think, falls not quite, but sort of in that category, as I'll, as I'll explain later on. Okay, and another thing I want to just clarify, uh, because there's often some confusion, uh, is that uh, there are actually sort of two different concepts of alternate universes. Uh, we have uh, the multiverse, which is a bunch of different universes that are simultaneously out there that are in addition to our own. And then there's another concept that uh, many of you have probably heard of, which is called the many worlds uh, idea of uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics. And that, that doesn't really call for separate uh, universes to exist. It's rather they're alternate histories of a single universe, so, or even of multiple universes. So you could have uh, many different uh, parallel versions of you, which are, which are each one of which uh, took the road less traveled by. Uh, and those would be the, uh, the worlds of quantum mechanics. So I just wanna make that distinction. And in this talk, I'm, uh, for the most part, I'm gonna talk about uh, the multiverse, the actual other universes out there somewhere uh, elsewhere that, um, that may or may not exist. Okay, so in the question, in terms of how many uh, such universes are there, um, Paul has already discussed this, and but I wanna sort of just uh, refine that a little bit and by distinguishing between uh, various different uh, versions of this question. Uh, and one question is how many other universes are there that are connected to our own observable universe? Okay, things that we can actually, you know, we can see only a finite part of the universe and are there, how much more universes there attached to that? Another one is how many, are there other universes that are not attached, that are disconnected from observable universe? And then finally, how many different types of universe could there be? So uh, I was trying to think of a, an analogy and uh, imagine that the universe is a whale, something big, and we are uh, uh, a, a microbe living, a physicist microbe, of course, uh, living on this uh, whale. Um, from our little vantage point of view, we can't, we can't see the whole whale, we can only see the observable whale. Um, and we would like to know how much more there is of this whale. We don't know anything about it, whether what, what its ultimate, uh, um, how many different region, observable regions there are, what its shape is, whether the whale is finite or infinite. So that's, that kind of question is the first question here. But another question is, there are other whales out there that are not the whale that we're on. Uh, and then finally, are there other species of whale that could, uh, what are all the different species of whales that could exist? So that's, that's sort of, the version of the multiverse. Uh, and maybe that helps to think about what, how these questions are distinct. And so uh, I'm just gonna give answers and then I will, um, I will try to justify them. So here they are. Um, so the answer to the first question is we don't know, but probably many. Uh, and that's according to Big Bang cosmology. And the answer to the second question about how many actual universes there are is that uh, if we believe in the theory of eternal inflation, uh, then there are probably infinite number. And in terms of how many types of universes there could be, how many different species of whale, there are, as Paul mentioned, at least 10 to the 500, which is a staggeringly large number. Just to put it in context, there are, I think, 10 to the uh, let's see, 88 bits in the universe. Uh, so, so this is a really a, a colossal number. Okay, so let me try to justify these uh, numbers a little bit. 
So here's what um, Big Bang cosmology says. The Big Bang says, the standard theory of the Big Bang says that our universe was created some 13.7 billion years ago, as uh, we know from music to the Big Bang theory. Uh, and, um, uh, and as a result, because of the finite travel time of light, we can only see part of it. That's our observable universe. And the part that we can't see, we don't know whether it's finite or infinite. But here, but that has an amazing, but if it's infinite, there's an incredible um, sort of logical consequence of that. Our observable universe has only a finite number of configurations given in quantum gravity. That's because it has what's called a finite entropy. Then even though it's a huge number, it's still finite and uh, any finite number uh, goes into an infinite number, uh, an infinite number of times. So if, the, if space is actually infinite, then every single configuration of our observable universe is likely to be repeated an infinite number of times. That means that there is a world where this very talk is happening with other people who think they're the unique such people, another Malik rambling on, uh, thinking that he's giving this talk just to this one audience, not realizing that it's just an infinite uh, replay of uh, other things going on in other universes. That's, that is a, uh, would be a consequence of the infinity of space. And that's uh, more or less unavoidable uh, if, well, if we believe that our universe has finite number of configurations, which quantum gravity suggests it does. Okay, here are the predictions of eternal. Okay, but I should also say the universe could, the space could actually be finite um, that would be sort of like these old video games where you can uh, go off from the top and then come out from the bottom. Uh, and so the, the actual, there will be no boundary, but the world will still be finite. And if that's the case, then there are only a finite number of observable universes. Uh, and once and given enough time, we'll see them all. But this is all, all still just one universe. It had a, it had a single birth in terms of all of these observable universes within this one universe would, uh, all originated in one big bang. All right. Uh, there are, there's a theory of eternal inflation and, and this is how, and let me just say a bit about that. So um, inflationary cosmology is a variant of uh, the cosmology that solves several puzzles of big bang cosmology and, and predicts this galaxies and so forth. And it says that the universe went through a period of exponentially rapid expansion. This is known as inflation. Okay, so imagine this kind of uh, boiling uh, sea of, uh, uh, of energy. Uh, and uh, every once in a while, somewhere in this boiling sea of energy, the uh, expansion comes to a halt. And when it does that, it gives birth to a little, uh, baby universe, a little uh, um, bubble of universe, uh, just like a little bubble forming in, this, in, a, in water. Um, but we we'll soon realized that the expansion need not have halted everywhere at the same time, which means that the inflate that inflation could go on forever, could be eternal little bubbles that are forming in it. And each one of these is its own new bubble universe. And each one of them has its own big bang. So we could be living in one bubble universe and there could be others, other whales as it were, that are forming elsewhere in this infinitely expanding sea. Uh, in this picture, uh, we would have something like this. There's a boiling uh, cauldron of bubble universes, each one of which uh, uh, could have uh, life on it or not. Um, and by the way, uh, the, these, this, in these pictures, they, the universes all look finite, but because of the peculiarities of uh, space and time, it's actually possible to have an infinite amount of space in one of these bubbles. And uh, that's a pretty mind bending thing, but it's possible with general relativity. Okay, and then lastly, let me tell you about string theory. So string theory is an attempt to find a theory of everything. Uh, it's been around for about 50 years uh, and was originally hoped that the theory would make a unique prediction for the constant things that we really wanted to know that, that we, uh, that we uh, measure in a uh, particle accelerator is like, you know, what is the mass of an electron? What is the force of gravity? Uh, what is the force? What is the mass of the Higgs? And so on. What is the strength of attraction between a proton and electron and so forth. That didn't turn out to be the case. Uh, we didn't just find a unique prediction, uh, prediction from string theory. Instead, we have an embarrassment of riches, a real embarrassment, 
in that there are 10 to the 500, at least, and maybe even infinite number of solutions. Each of which of these uh, different solutions of this theory, each of these um, universe, each of these, um, yeah, each of these predictions corresponds to a universe with its own constants of nature. So in one of them, the electron might be a little heavier or maybe not, or a little lighter, uh, or, or, or the electric, electric attraction uh, would be different. And as such, some of them may, have, may not even have atoms uh, and uh, there might even be their own laws of physics there. Uh, but what they have in common, they're not completely, uh, you can't, it's not an anything goes, what, all, what they all have in common is that they all have gravity. And that's the unifying theme of all of these. Okay, so, so it's, we're not at, yet at a metaphysical level where we're thrown, just allowing anything to go. This is still a prediction of a physical theory. Uh, and the prediction is that uh, there are 10 to the 500 vacua of string theory, so to speak, each of which, all of which have gravity. So all of these types of universes could exist, but do they exist? And uh, here I have to um, invoke uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, eternal inflation, as we saw, has all these different bubbles. So there are many, many possibilities for these universes to exist. And then there's this so-called totalitarian principle of quantum mechanics that says that everything that is not forbidden is mandatory. In quantum mechanics, everything that can happen does happen. And so the Universes, they can exist, which means they do exist. Um, so if eternal inflation provides some, uh, 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 enough universes for these, uh, these uh, different worlds of string theory to be realized, then they will be realized. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna try to run through this. I just wanna, uh, so here's a summary of what we found. Uh, uh, I also added how sure we are of this result. So in uh, Big Bang cosmology, the theory itself is solid, but there's no clear prediction about the ultimate uh, finiteness or infiniteness of the universe. Uh, eternal inflation is, is rather less clear whether the theory uh, holds up um, under back reaction of quantum gravity, uh, but the prediction itself looks solid. Uh, whereas in string theory, the theory is very, uh, is now there's a world, lots of evidence, theoretical evidence for it, uh, but the prediction itself is unclear. The mathematics is a little bit, uh, hard to interpret. So um, that's where we stand. So we can't say for sure that the multiverse exists or doesn't exist because the status of these predictions is itself not clear. Um, okay, I wanna just end by asking whether, uh, by saying that there's another way that we could, could actually detect uh, the multiverse. This is really, this is much more uh, optimistic. Uh, and that is that these bubbles like any bubbles, bubbles in a cauldron could actually collide with each other. And that, then we could even detect them experimentally. So uh, this is what would happen. Uh, this is an artist's depiction of uh, two universes colliding, two bubble universes colliding. There's a, and then there are a bunch of different things that could happen. Um, here are some uh, possibilities. Uh, one possibility is that it's fatal, These um, the two universes Produce a singularity. Uh, uh, it's in a, a region where it's a where space time itself is destroyed. Another one is that it's uh, it's not so uh, dramatic that there's actually uh, just a, a pulse of energy transmitted to from one to the other. Uh, that would be that would leave a kind of a bruise at the site of collision, and that could actually be observed. And here is are some uh, uh, some possibilities that you might actually be able to see in the cosmic microwave background. Uh, the imprint of where another world might have hit us. Uh, uh, and then finally, uh, maybe the, if the universes are so similar, uh, they might just merge seamlessly and might not even be aware of, it, of the collision. Uh, and then finally, the last thing I want to say is uh, we can also have collisions of, of course, two different types of universes, and then you might, with two different laws of physics, and then you can ask, what happens when two different regions with different laws of physics combine? What happens? Who wins? And the answer is that in general, the lower energy universe wins. So the, uh, if, if they collide, the, if, wherever they collide, the lower energy one transforms the higher energy universe into its own type. And in this case, if we were the losing universe in the higher energy universe, we would see the edge of the other universe coming towards us. And uh, that edge, that, that wall uh, is reflective. So it would look to us like a giant mirror 
uh, that's approaching us before it uh, wipes us out. It wipes out also all our atoms and everything else. With okay, on that sunny note, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you, Molik. Okay, we have a lot of ch uh, questions um, between the um, chat to the panelists and also the Q&A. And then I ha we have some questions that came in um, prior uh, to today's festivities. So, um, so I'm going to be going kind of between them asking um, questions on behalf of our audience. Um, and so I'm going to pull from the chat here first. There's a question from, um, let's see here. Uh, Rias Nassam, who asks, what qualities separate one universe from another? Madlik, I think you just really dealt with that, didn't yeah. you? Uh, yeah. So you, you might have different low energy physics, uh, typically different values of the fundamental constants and so on. Yeah. So, so they would have one, the thing that they would all have in common common is that they would all have gravity. Uh, but uh, what would be different is that maybe some of them might not even have atoms, some uh, others. Uh, the main difference is in something called the uh, vacuum energy, which is um, the energy of, well, the vacuum. Now you might think that the vacuum should have an energy of zero because there's nothing in it, but that turns out not to be the case. And so there are many, many uh, different worlds in which the amount of energy in the vacuum is different. And some of these uh, uh, worlds, if they had too much vacuum energy, they wouldn't form galaxies because they would, they would just blow apart. And other ones where uh, there's not enough, they would just collapse in, in, in a, on, on themselves. So um, that would, I think, be the main, most dramatic uh, effect of the differences. Well, one of them. Um, great, thank you. Um, so this question comes from Derek Youngson. Uh, the question is, is it possible that any explanation of alternate is, is actually beyond our comprehension and always will be, um, such that any plausible explanations would need to come from non-ergotic silicon-based life forms at some point in the future and possibly long after humans are gone. So it's beyond our comprehension as a species, but maybe some other alien intelligence might be able to comprehend it. I'm happy to just say very briefly that so this was the way Douglas Adams famously dealt with it uh, in his book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, there, there's no reason, in my view, uh, why the human brain should have evolved to unlock all of the secrets of nature. We may simply get stuck. Uh, that's a limitation of biology. We might create super duper computers that would figure it all out, uh, but it wouldn't mean anything to us. So just like in the Douglas Adams story, the answer is 42. How disappointing is that? Doesn't mean anything. Uh, and so I could well envisage that uh, we, we will um, reach the boundaries of the human age at some stage, and maybe uh, we're almost there. Well, uh, if I can jump in on this, I mean, in a quote that's often attributed to Einstein, um, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. And I think that uh, even though the universe is a vast place, uh, the laws itself seem to be quite simple. Uh, they're not very, they're, they're deeply hidden, but they're, they seem to be accessible to us. Uh, it's, we're, doing well, we're doing well so far, so I, I, I'm optimistic. That we are, we're doing it much better than uh, you would expect just from uh, Darwinian evolution. Yes. Uh, there's no reason that surviving in the proverbial jungle equips you to understand quantum mechanics or what goes on inside black holes. So, yeah, on a more serious note, uh, there, there, there may be reasons why we cannot answer these questions, but uh, they're probably not uh, due to the, our intellectual limitations. They're probably due to the other. Well, uh, also you have to ask, um, are, are the questions well posed? Uh, yeah. And very often in science, when you really do get stuck, it's because you're asking the wrong question. And so we're casting most of the uh, discussion today around sort of everyday concepts of uh, you know one too many uh, all that sort of thing uh, standard uh, logic and uh, coming up with explanations in terms of cause and effect and all of these things that uh, hidden assumptions that go into all scientific explanations and it could be that when we get into this territory like you said my like it's you know is this even science that when we get to these uh, ultimate questions that we have to rephrase them differently or 
the nature of the answer, the explanation uh, might be different from what we are used to in the past. Uh, so we, we, we have to accept that we are being very ambitious in tackling these sorts of topics, but that's what we like to do in the Beyond Center. Right. Um, so I'm going to move on to our next question, but Malik, I'm also going to ask if you could unshare your screen so that the panelists can see both of you as you're answering the questions. Um, I think oh, am I still sharing the screen? Okay, yeah. uh, let me figure Thank out how to do that. So I'm going to, um, there's two questions that are kind of maybe getting at different sides of the same question. So I'm going to ask the two questions from um, our two audience members. So the first question was from Bobby Hackett asking, would each universe have its own Big Bang or could there have been one biggest bang that created all the multiverse at once? And the related question, so you'll kind of maybe see where I'm relating these things is, Javier Magrina asks, is there the concept of God in the creation of the Big Bang? So where was the biggest bang and does that have anything to do with God? I have a quick go at that because there's an on, on running uh, disagreement in eternal inflation uh, between Alex Belenkin, who insists that uh, the uh, that it could not be eternal, that there must have been a singularity somewhere in the past. And Andre Lindy, who said it can be eternal. So you could imagine a, a sort of super bang that brings the multiverse into existence and then all the little bubble bangs that uh, bring the universes uh, to be. Or it, we don't know, or it may not have been that way, but that's one possibility. Um, and uh, in, in terms of the theological dimension, well, I just touched on that briefly. You either believe that the universe came into existence uh, for natural reasons or supernatural reasons. And you can choose supernatural if you prefer, and that could be a, a very long topic. And I think we'll ring fence that here today because we can revisit something uh, along those lines in a future Ask a Physicist, I think. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. Um, so we have a lot of questions. I'm gonna go right to question now. Um, this one is from Robert Bros, um, and it's specifically to Molik. Um, it says, uh, the question goes, you suggest in string theory, all universes have gravity. Do they also share the gravity time interaction? Not sure on the technical term, but referring to the way time runs differently at different points in a gravity well. Would that be characteristic of all these multiverses also? So I think there are references. Yes. Uh, so, so, uh, um, in general relativity, um, time is not something that ticks away in the same same way everywhere in the uh, in um, the universe. Uh, Wheeler had a nice description of it. It's a many fingered time where it pushes forward more in one some place and uh, basically comes to a halt at the edge of a black hole and so on. Uh, so uh, th that feature remains true of all the solutions of string theory. Thank you. Okay, our next question um, comes from Barbara Temple, and there are actually two questions on Max Tegmark's um, hierarchy of how he talks about different layers of the multiverse. Um, so I'm going to pose both questions to you, and then you guys can answer them. The first one is, according to Max Tegmark's love of multiverse, the laws of physics would be different from our own, but not so different that the laws of physics would use a different mathematical structure, which would be the level four multiverse. What might a level two multiverse be like? And then the second question, which is related, is of Tegmark's four levels of multiverse, which one do you regard as plausible? So where would you draw the boundaries um, of the multiverse, basically? And what would a, another universe in similar mathematical laws have, but that would be different? Do you want to? To first explain that, uh, that, that I was going to say, Mary, this this is probably one for you because okay. you introduced two different versions of the multiverse, and, and Max has right. a scheme oh, where they uh, become yeah. the same. So let, let me so just uh, to those who are not familiar, so Max Tegmark Cosmos at MIT, who uh, big proponent of the multiverse, and he um, <clears throat> has sort of divided it into different four types of multiverse. Level one is just the stuff that's outside our observable universe. I think uh, we can be very sure that there's something there. It would be remarkable if uh, the universe that we see just now, 13, uh, bang is all there is, because you know, five minutes from now, we should be seeing a little bit more of it. Uh, and uh, it would be very soon if we reach the boundary of that uh, suddenly. So, um, uh, it, that's almost certainly true that there's that there's more universe out there than we can see. 
the level two is uh, the, uh, are other universes that are uh, that are created in other bubbles that have other laws of physics. But I think the word laws of physics is not a great one because that seems to suggest that anything goes. Uh, in fact, it's more accurate to say there are different constants of nature there. And so there are there is a common thing. There is still, the, in fact, I may be wrong about this, but I think the electron exists in all of them maybe in all of them, or there are certain, there are certain fields that exist in all of these, and, uh, and definitely, the, uh, well, maybe not the electron, but uh, the, graviton, uh, the gravity for sure. So uh, these other laws have, uh, these other places would have different constants as we uh, discussed, and uh, whether or not you believe this level two uh, universe exists depends on whether you think eternal inflation um, is correct whether there are just bubbles forming all the time. And I uh, personally hope that it isn't, <laughs> but um, yeah. Uh, well, I just uh, said you three, think something else? Uh, well, let me, yeah. so level three. Uh, well, oh, sorry, you haven't finished uh, yet. Let me finish there, uh, two more levels. So level three is, is actually quantum mechanics. It has nothing to do with them. Uh, it's, it's just the idea of parallel universe. It's an interpretation of quantum mechanics, which, um, uh, as you might know, the quantum mechanics is, uh, is, is sort of confusing to understand, and this is one of the interpretations. Uh, I like it, so I think that there are these alternate histories, but uh, it, it's an open question, which we haven't answered. And level four is, I think, absurd. That level four says that every mathematical structure corresponds to, uh, to a physics, and I, I don't think that's uh, a meaningful statement in any way. Sorry, Paul. Yes. Well, well, and I think uh, uh, part of the questions that Barbara is asking here, and people always want to ask is, well, all this multiverse stuff is very exciting, but how could we possibly test it? What evidence might there be for it? And uh, of course, you, well, so you mentioned, uh, Malik, about uh, you know, one of the other bubbles uh, running into ours, and that's, that's one way. But in the absence of that, um, there is a sort of weak statistical test that gets discussed from time to time. And it's best described in terms of an, an analogy that Martin Rees introduced, that one of the oddities about the way the Earth goes around the sun, it's, its orbit is very nearly circular. Uh, whereas, of course, it, it could be uh, orb, orbits are ellipses and the eccentricity can be as much as you want. And so why do we live on a planet that's uh, you know, got a roughly circular orbit? Is Earth special? Well, the truth is, if it were uh, very far uh, from, uh, if, if the eccentricity were very high, then the climate on Earth would not be congenial for beings, advanced beings like us to talk about these things. And so it's a sort of anthropic selection effect that we live on a planet that is has an almost but not quite completely circular orbit. And you could do statistics on this. Um, if it turned out the Earth, uh, Earth's orbit were circular like to one part in a trillion, it, that would look very, very weird. Um, you'd think there must be some sort of law of nature. Um, and so you might expect that if you have selected a planet for your existence uh, on the basis that it should be biologically congenial, it would be somewhere sort of typical in the range of possible values. So when we look, uh, apply this principle to the universe as a whole, and we can say, well, what are the parameters uh, on which life is sensitive? You mentioned uh, the cosmological constant, and uh, I talked a little bit about um, the uh, strong nuclear force and so on. And you can make a list of those. You would expect that if there is a multiverse, and if we simply are typical beings, uh, nothing special about us, we live in a typical universe that can support life, that we should be somewhere in the sort of in the middle of the parameter range. We should be right on the edge of a parameter. Uh, and that means that you can make the prediction as we measure those uh, uh, parameters better and better, and as we uh, better and better understand the sensitivity of biological systems to the values of those parameters, we should find ourselves not going towards more and more atypical, but more and more typical. So it's a weak statistical way in which you could argue that we live in a multiverse. But it, it, there's no sort of, it's not like you can devise a lab experiment and that, yes, that's what it shows up there in that meter. I don't know anything like that. Great. All right, I'm gonna move um, to our next set of questions um, because we don't have too much 
longer and we have lots more questions to get through. Um, so these are both related to the nature of infinity. So there's actually two questions that I'm gonna ask again, but it's, uh, they're coming in themes. So the first one's from Leah Jameson um, who asked, could you please elaborate on the Toltarian principle and why all universes that are possible necessarily exist? The prime numbers are in infinite, but there's plenty of integers that aren't included in that set. What size of infinity do you mean when you say there may be infinite universes? And the second question actually just builds right off of that, which is um, from James Benford, who asks, you are using infinity in several ways. Could Cantor's classes of infinities be of use? So please explain what you mean by infinity. <laughs> We've been sloppy. Excellent question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think actually, this is where this... Countable. Yes, Sorry, for sure uh, they're, they're countable. Um, but even otherwise, there, there, is, there are actually a lot of problems with defining probabilities um, when, they're, when, they're, when things are infinite and uh, in trying to determine the measure of, uh, on, on these spaces, which are just sort of, well, there are problems with infinity throughout, which make a lot of the predictions that we have in this, uh, that's actually one of the weak points of these theories that we, we're not sure what we really mean here because we're not in control of the of things that are of sort of well it's all there's almost a sort of a fractal the, the, the what happens is uh, when once the uh, once the as as, this, as these bubbles start forming uh, you know the, the 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 structure of this the the space that's still inflating the sea becomes fractal. Uh, and so um, it's not even, it's, it's, yeah, there are all sorts of mathematical problems, which I think I'm not really able to, I don't think anybody with a clear answer to this. Um, but the I other just, uh, sorry. yeah, um, is that's something, that's on much firmer grounds. That, should, that simply says that in quantum mechanics, uh, if you have a, a set of possibilities that have any uh, non-zero probabilities, uh, then they're all going to be realized. And that, that's the reason uh, that we can't, it, it's meaningless in quantum mechanics to imagine a universe, to imagine um, existence going back for all eternity, but a bubble appearing just some finite yeah. time ago. Because if you have a probability in quantum mechanics, however small it is, uh, it will be instantiated. If you have, and then you have an infinite amount of time, it will be instantiated an infinite number of times. So you're led back to this multiverse. But I, I did want to just pick up whilst we're talking about these issues of infinity, because I noticed that Barbara Temple had asked um, a, a, a very profound question about uh, the quantum multiverse, and that if all the branches of the wave function are instantiated as, as it were real universes somewhere, whatever happened to the Bourne rule and uh, the pro emergence of probability uh, in uh, in quantum mechanics is, uh, is a high probability in quantum mechanics associated with many, many branches, identical branches of the wave function or not. And I know people have struggled with this, how to, get, how to recover the notion of probability in quantum mechanics when uh, you have everything. The whole notion of probability is, is more than nothing, but it's not everything, uh, it's something in between. And how do you get that uh, in, uh, in the, Everett or the many universes interpretation of quantum mechanics. I don't know that that, I know David Deutsch did claim at one stage that he'd solved that problem, but I don't uh, really know of a satisfactory answer to how to recover the standard Born rule statistics of quantum mechanics uh, out of the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. Do you know differently, uh, Mara? How to recover the Born rule? No. No, so I think I, it's, I, a, it's appended I, to the multiverse uh, explanation. It's just as it is to the Copenhagen. Uh, okay. So that's, that's uh, we'll, we'll leave that one to the uh, next generation of theoretical physicists. Yes, so for all of you physicists out there, there's a problem for you to work on. Great. Um, all right, so our next question, um, there's so many good ones, it's hard to pick them all. Um, Let's see, this one is from Tom Quacky. 
if energy cannot be created or destroyed, where are all these energies for infinite universes coming from? Um, so I'm going to just... That's an easy one. <laughs> okay. That's an easy one. Do you want to do it, Matic, or shall I do it? Go ahead. All right. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so what is the energy of our universe? Well, you can tot up all the matter. There's about 10 to the 50 tons of it. Uh, use E equals MC squared. That's a big number you get. Uh, but uh, in addition to the energy of uh, material objects, uh, you've got uh, gravitational energy. Uh, so think about plucking the Earth out of the solar system. You've got to do work to pull it away from the sun. Uh, that tells you that the gravitational energy of bound systems is negative. So all those galaxies pulling on all those other galaxies represents negative energy. And you can add up how much negative energy there is. And it's precisely minus 10 to the power 50 tons expresses mass. So the total energy of the universe comes out as zero. Uh, and the best evidence for that is that the spatial geometry of the universe is flat, Euclidean. Uh, and so uh, we felt very confident for quite a long time that the total energy is actually zero. So it's not an energy problem. The universe can pop into being without you having to have an input of energy. Some people say, well, no, well, that means everything's explained. There's no mystery about the origin of the universe. But of course, um, there's plenty still, uh, not least of which is whether the laws of physics, uh, which permit uh, bubble universes to uh, pop into being with uh, zero energy, where do they come from? Uh, so it's not an explanation of everything, but energy itself is not a problem. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. Um, so we have time for one last question. I think we have about three minutes left. Um, so this question comes from Alexa Drew, um, and I think it's related to recent headlines about the structure of uh, the cosmos being related to the structure of the brain. Um, so, uh, so um, uh, Alexa's question is, the structure of the universe's cosmic web is remarkably similar to that of neural and chemical networks. That might be just coincidence, but it's possible that universes, or is it possible that you that universes within universes could exist just at different levels? If so, how likely is that and how we might how might we observe it? So maybe we can clarify since people are seeing headlines about these things, about the relationship between large scale structure and neural tissue. Well, I saw that, I saw those. Are we, are we waiting for Alexa to? Uh, uh, no, that's the end of the comments. question, so yeah. So, oh, I see. I, 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 your yeah, I saw that and I thought, well, what is this nonsense? Yeah, it might be um, useful for other but, panelists too. I mean, our other audience members too that are also seeing these headlines to have a little bit of clarity from some experts, so yeah. But, but I, I think, uh, uh, you know, you can, it's true that when you stand back and you look at the large scale structure of the universe, it does remind you a lot of things. To me, it reminds me of a sort of mess of spider's webs uh, and has done for a long time. There are filaments and sheets and things like that which are well understood. Um, wh where I think that this is not a ridiculous uh, uh, comparison uh, is that there are certain uh, print structure and complexity uh, and the, the growth of complex systems, whether it's uh, the dendrites in the brain or uh, e networks of e ecosystems or whatever, that we see similar sorts uh, in nature. And it could well be that uh, on the cosmological scale, that, that, these, uh, that it's, it's a rather basic feature of certain mathematical laws that you would expect these structures to emerge. And I might say, uh, I'm probably the only one here old enough to remember, there was a time when there was something called hierarchical cosmology, uh, which was um, quite popular, uh, which meant that you look at uh, stars form clusters, that star clusters form galaxies, the galaxies form clusters of galaxies, they form superclusters. Maybe this cluster goes on uh, forever and ever and ever. Uh, and that uh, the universe isn't uniform on the very large scale. I don't believe that, but it was popular about 50 years ago, uh, that hierarchical Thanks. view. So, um, you know, I get around, they come around. Uh, it's fun to think about. Yes. Excellent, thank you, Paul. Um, so I wanna thank um, both our panelists again. So thank you very much, Molik and Paul for answering all the questions. And thank you to our audience for all of the excellent questions today. We had so many, we couldn't get through all of them, um, but we do appreciate all the enthusiasm and all the intellectual rigor you're all bringing to these discussions. Um, so, um, so thank you again for joining us. Please come back in January when we're gonna be 
talking about whether there's multiple forms of life on earth or how we might look for it. Um, and we will see you then. Have a great evening, everyone, or morning, wherever you are.